how to increase your passive income with real estate. Um, we're going to go through a number of, of different strategies that we use and our clients use to increase your passive income. And really what it comes down to is maximizing your rent and minimizing your costs. And you guys are all real estate investors, so you probably study the numbers, you know what to do. But we're hoping out of this seminar, you can get some tricks and tips that we use to really, really, you know, squeeze every last dollar out of those rental properties. Because in a high interest environment or in a different market where it was a low rent environment, you need to reorganize the way you're doing business so that you're still cash flowing. We want to keep you out of the negative. That's our number one goal uh, that we strive for. So we'll move forward with the first one. Um, it may not be for everybody, but it's definitely going to help with your cash flow. Yeah. If anyone has a question, please just yell at any time. And if anyone's online, just put it in the chat. Tim will have a look at it. Now, adding a suite, we're just roughly talking about this. This is Daniel Kelly. He's actually looking for his fourth property right now. And he must be very frustrated because um, he's a young guy. Um, he JV'd with his dad on one of them. One of them, yeah. He JV'd with a buddy on another one, has his own. They're all suited properties. And I don't even know how old Daniel would be, Tim. 29. 29. Um, and now he's looking for his, his fifth property, fourth property. Um, yeah, so that's one of his in Huntington Hills. He's standing beside his little permit uh, sign there. Um, he bought that place with no suite in the basement. He actually put his own kitchen in there. He went through the whole process to put it in the right way to legalize it. And now he's got a legal suite in there. How much did that cost him to put that suite in that? I think it was about 35000 in yeah. there. But so he... that was starting from scratch. There was no illegal suite in there. He just started from scratch. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, he, he did a yeah. lot of the market. Yeah. 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 He did a lot. Like he did the ceiling. Yes. Yeah. And stuff like yeah. that. And and when when he when we we say he put a kitchen in there, it was no like, it was probably as small as this kitchen, right? Yeah. Just a one bank of cabinets up top, fridge stove, dishwasher, and that was it, and a sink. And you don't want to spend much on on a basement rent. Right We've seen people go over the top. You're only going to max out on your rents at fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars max. So, so you don't want to go and spend too much money. Like we get this question all the time: Should you add a garage suite, like a carriage house? And to build those things these days are upwards of like three hundred thousand dollars. So, is it worth it to get fifteen hundred? I'd like you'd have to see if it's really worth it. Um, the only way I would see that being worth it is if you would use equity in a property, maybe. But that one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand, depending how you do it, that can go a long way on a whole property. So, um, yeah, I, just speaking to that suite over the garage, the misconception is that people can use the existing garage. The city will never let you do that. You're gonna have to tear the thing down and build from new. Um, doesn't matter how sturdy that original garage is, uh, you'll never get it through the permit process to add a suite to the top. And if you do, it's basically on stilts supporting itself so that would cost even more than what as i was quoting yeah ideally with the suite like this one here um ideally you want to find a property that has an existing suite because then it gets grandfathered in we always want our clients to legalize uh the suites that they have uh, we help them with the whole process to turn it into a legal suite some of the things they're looking for are egress windows smoke detectors of course uh, drywall in the furnace room um, drywall ceiling um, they're probably the main things and then separate entrance and the entrance could be we've seen uh, walkout basements with sliding doors um, there's all different situations that could happen but ideally with the property you want you want it to have a good layout and we find that Tim one bedroom it doesn't matter if it's one or two two's obviously better um, but if it's only a one bedroom and it's a big one bedroom the best thing you could find with a suite or a bungalow is the size. You want to be looking at bungalows that are over 900 to 1,000 square feet. Anything smaller, if it's in the 800 square feet, when you go down in the basement, you take away the mechanical room, it will drop the floor plan down to about 750 square feet. And when that happens, you're really limited on what rents you can get for that property now. Um, so ideally you want to find something that's existing and then you just update it. You just put lipstick, either new flooring 
old paint or even painting the cabinets, new countertop, new appliances if possible. Um, but adding a suite, you're adding roughly $1,500 extra income to that property. Uh, and that's a great way to basically earn more money each month from your investment property. Okay, we've got a question here. Can you speak to any experience with adding a separate heating for a legalized suite? Um, well, the rules around that are as if your suite was not pre-existing before 2018, you do have to have a, se a separate heat source for up and down. So what we see is some people put electric baseboard heat either in the basement or the main floor. So they're avoiding putting in another furnace because to put in another furnace and rearrange the ductwork so that each furnace is operated independently could be upwards of eight, $9,000. Mm -hmm. um, furnaces aren't cheap these days. Ever since the city went to, or the province went to high efficiency only, you're looking at $6,000 minimum to put in a furnace, like to replace a furnace. And then to do all the ductwork changes and separate the 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 fire separate the top and the bottom, it's going to cost yeah a lot of money. So if it's pre 2018, if the suite was there before then, you can get away with shared heat. Mm -hmm. um, that may go away at the end of this year. Oh yeah, really? We're hoping not, but uh, we have to just stay updated on that. The yeah. City, um, They've extended this twice already. Yeah. Uh, when they came in with, with rules to simplify legalizing uh, existing secondary suites, um, that second extension ends at the end of this year. So we'll see. They did it so that more and more people would legalize their suites and we would increase the number of suites in the secondary suite registry. Mm -hmm. It's over 11,000 now in there, 12,000. Yeah. So it's predicted or estimated that there's roughly 30 to 35,000 well, ill suited properties in Calgary. And out of that 30 to 35,000, there's only 11,000 that are legal. And it's really ramping up because they're building a lot of new places in the new communities with suites, um, you know, in the new construction. So it's good that it's, the number's going up, but adding a suite could definitely add more income uh, each month for sure. And the cheapest we've ever legalized a, a suited basement um, was roughly around $2,500. So basically we went in there and there wasn't much to be done with smoke detectors. Yeah, they put smoke detectors and that's about it. I think it. they had a sprinkler system. In yeah. A, I think, yeah, yeah a sprinkler system. Payment. Yeah. So you can find properties that there are, they are illegal and then turn it into a legal. It, it, it sometimes doesn't cost a lot of money at all, um, but they're hard to find right now. Okay, moving on. Um, another way to increase your cash flow, uh, student rentals. Now, student rentals are really, really big in Eastern Canada because there's so many smaller universities. Toronto's got a million of them. A lot of the towns surrounding Toronto are university towns. The Maritimes have a lot of universities uh, with not a lot of population. So a lot of students come from outside of the Maritimes to go to these universities, they need a place to stay. Um, in Calgary here, you can call it student rentals, but unless you're right beside Mount Royal or right beside the UFC, mm -hmm. you're just gonna be renting rooms. But it's an ideal way to really, really uh, maximize your rent. Rooms these days are going for mm -hmm. roughly $1,000. We've seen $1,200 for nicer uh, yeah. suite of places. We have one client who had a number of duplexes right by Mount Royal on 50th Ave. Yeah. And he had a management system where he rented only to female students. So he provided safe housing for female students and they all rented rooms, shared the kitchen. He had a suite downstairs in each one. Mm -hmm. So he was he was getting, uh, what was it? 1300 for each room mm -hmm. on the main floor and 1300 for each room on the basement. Yeah, it was fully um, renovated property. So if you do these things to 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 market towards a niche market. Like if you're a female student coming from out of town and you can find a place where you got to rent a room, but you're renting it with only female students, you know, that's a it's kind of a no-brainer. So there are tips that you can do to get better tenants in your rooms. We've seen some uh student rentals, they're basically rooming houses mm -hmm. in some of these older houses downtown here, and they're just rooming houses. They're fire yeah. traps and it's terrible like this one here that's behind the picture we did um a tour with our investors through this student yeah. rental i don't even think they were students like they were new to canada they were just new to canada and they just needed um 
a room basically yeah. the only thing with student rental is if you are going to rent to non-students you might get a lot of um tenants that turn over uh they come and go so they might be transient but that's how it goes with student rentals uh and the only other thing that we kind of teach our investors when we are buying student rentals is the common area it normally gets let go sometimes like the kitchen or the hallway where you walk in and out of um, the entrance way. I mean, it can get a little messy because if you don't have rules in place, the students won't clean up their mess basically. So you just want to have strict rules so it stays nice and neat and that the properties. Yeah, and, and another up. thing that some of our clients are doing is in the kitchens, they'll have like two or three fridges. So these students, they're not all sharing one fridge and you know they're they go grocery shopping and half their food gets eaten by someone else. So it creates conflict. But if you have um, also more than one set of uh, washing or dryers, say in the basement, wherever the common laundry is, if you have two sets of laundry, you will have less conflict as well. It's more upfront costs, but these people tend to t tend to stay longer because they have more fridge space. They've got more, you know, there's more laundry so that they have time to do it. There's things like that that you can um do to make them stay longer and while that cost of a, an extra laundry set you can go get a used set for 250 bucks a piece and then you've got you know you're making the tenants happy yeah no it's it's a great way right now we know in ontario that it's huge buying properties for student rentals yeah it's more management but it's definitely going to be more cash flow especially when the numbers right now are around a thousand to twelve hundred dollars per room um it could make you a lot of money okay the next one is rent to own uh rent to own is always a big thing when the market's flat or on its way down um it's a little tougher in this market because uh sellers who will maybe put their property on a rent to own they can just throw it on the market even if it's a problem property and they can get the price that they want but it's a very, very good way to increase your cash flow if you're if you're at a break-even point or if you're, even if you're in the negative. Yeah. So rent to own, how it works is a tenant will actually pay you a deposit. Um, we've personally done uh, rent to owns upwards of forty, maybe forty-five thousand dollar deposits, so huge amounts. But the typical rent to own, like this property here, I think the deposit was twenty thousand dollars. But typically, it would be anywhere from five to twenty thousand dollars. That's probably yeah. what you you wouldn't take any less. And so that money basically, um, the landlord gets it, and then he charges rent credits above the rental amount. So if he's say renting a property that would rent for two thousand, he may ch charge twenty five hundred, and that extra five hundred dollars goes towards um, with the deposit goes towards that person qualifying and raising the deposit to buy the prop property off you at a later date. So you always have a pre predetermined amount, uh, what the property's worth. We work with our investors to work it out if it's a two, three, four year term, where we think the value will be. Um, and then you set that end price when you do sign that rent to own agreement. So basically they're giving you the deposit, you get to hold on to that. Each month, they're giving you rent credits, $500 more than what the average rent would be for that property. And then at the end of the day, whatever it adds up to, if it's a two, three, four year term, all that money extra gets calculated. And there's two ways to do it at the end. One is to basically um, have that in a separate account for them to use as a deposit for um, buying the property off you, or it just gets subtracted off the end uh, purchase price. So if it, if there's $50,000 there, um, the sad thing about it though, is if the tenant doesn't qualify, they lose all of those rent credits and they lose their deposit as well. So Tim, the, the, we, the one thing that we teach when we're helping someone through a rental home process, um, we can give them all the contracts and all that. But the main thing that they have to do is have those tenants work with a mortgage broker. If they're working with a mortgage broker for the length of the term, whether it's two, three or four years, they're in constant contact with them and he's checking their credit. He's making sure that they're saving up for a down payment. He's making sure they're not going out and buying a, a boat or something like that. That'll drop their credit by you know, 25 points overnight. So if you get to work or you get to the 
use the rent home process and you work with a qualified mortgage broker, we know a number of them that are very, very good with the rent own contracts and the rent to own process. Um, that will ensure success a lot more than just signing the contract and letting the tenant do his own thing. Um, they got into financial trouble in the first place. So if they're working with someone who's helping them along the way, you know, maintaining their credit and um, stay financially solvent, then your odds of success are a lot better than if they were just on their own. Yeah. And some people use this program because they're new to Canada. They don't have credit. So this is the best way for them to basically build up their credit, move into a place that they can treat like their own and then eventually own it. So it is a good program. It works. A lot of investors make money off it. And for the landlord, it increases your cash flow dramatically. Um, does the bank, does the bank um, well, you would have to work, use with a, use a mortgage broker that is familiar with the process. Um, your typical person in the bank, they won't touch it. Yeah. I mean, it's a long process, right? The banks generally want to qualify you on the spot and then say you're good or you're not. So you, you're working with a mortgage broker who knows what they're doing. That's probably your most, you're going to be, have your most success that way. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to the Burr strategy. Uh, if you don't know what the Burr strategy, it's buy, uh, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Um, this is one of our clients, Graham. He's on his third condo right now doing the Burr. Um, this first condo he got, Tim picked it up at Christmas time. Uh, not last Christmas. It was last Christmas, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, just last Christmas. And how much did you buy? Oh, the he bought this one. It was a two bedroom, one bathroom condo in the Arbor Lake point of view, which is right near the Crowfoot Crossing complex there. And he picked it up for 190000 which is crazy because he refinanced it after he had done the, the reno to it for two sixty. dollars yeah, 266 yeah. or something 266, like that. Yeah. So he refinanced his first property. He renovated it, got the bank back in. It had gone up and he could release enough equity um, to go do it again the second time. So, uh, and this is just on a, on a, a small little two bedroom condo. Um, and now he's onto his third property. And from doing all of these refinances, um, he's able to continue buying property. So yeah, and he started the whole process. He had one property in, um, what was it? Doing right Britain. next door to Anyways, there. he had, he had a house that he lived in and he refinanced that to start the process of doing these burrs one after another, after another. So that's where you got to seed capital from. Um, and when we're talking to people who go, well, you, how are you going to do this burr when you have to come up with the down payment and then you have to come up with the renovation costs? Well, we don't get into it in this seminar, but it's the raising capital portion of, of the real estate investment journey. You know, you can find that capital in your principal residence. You can find that capital in lines of credits. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it in joint ventures. You can find it in RRSP. RSP. So there's many, many ways to find the money to start a bird project. And we, like I said, we're not going to get into it, but he started his with just refinancing his principal residence. Yeah. And the whole thing about investing, if you want to continue to buy is getting that money out, your seed capital out and then reinvesting it into another property. So the best way to do that is by adding value. Um, he used our contractors on, on this, just uh, flooring, kept the same cabinets, right? I don't even know if he painted those cabinets. No, he didn't paint them. Just changed the pole. Just changed. Yeah. He, he didn't do much renos at all. Like, um flooring paint i think he did baseboards and then that's about it yeah and, and what he did was enough to satisfy the appraiser that went through for the bank to put it at a higher value um you know the initial cost was 190 he refinanced it at 266 well how did the bank figure that out how the appraiser figured that out we were looking at the comparables in that neighborhood and right around crowfoot crossing similar age buildings uh, with the renovations, they were selling in the you know the mid two fifties to two seventy five. So that's mm -hmm. how he got the the appraiser to appraise it at that. Mm -hmm. If he was in a community where you know you can buy an original pro property for one ninety and then renovate a property for two ten, there's really no spread in there. So there really, there's no point to do a burst strategy in a community where there is not a spread. Yeah, you really want to find properties or you want to be in areas that there's a massive gap. So uh, like the condo we were just showing you in the beginning of the presentation, Deb, 
brand new is at 650 to 680 and she just bought for 380. So no matter what, when an appraisers go in, they have to pull those comps from somewhere. So it doesn't matter if that building is brand new, there's still a justification that there's equity built in now and she can refinance that money and go again. And that's exactly what Graham did. So you want to find areas where there is a, a massive gap between renovated and unrenovated and then work out what your costs are going to be to get it looking just as good as the renovated properties out there. Um, and then refinancing. He actually broke his mortgage. He actually broke a good mortgage to get the money out to buy his second, buy his third property um, because it was it was worth it. And then the same property, he rented it out straight away for like 2,000, 2,100 yeah. uh, to cover all his costs. So now those properties are taken care of and he's already looking at buying another property. Uh, so it's definitely one way. And then when you do do the refinancing, we always say to, you, say to our investors, treat yourself, like take someone, whenever you refinance property, because it's tax-free dollars. And, and we all invest in real estate. We always say we have to enjoy ourselves as well. Go on a holiday, use some of that money to treat yourself with whatever you like doing, um, but also then buy another property as well. And that's the best thing about real estate that you can get that money out tax free that would normally take so long to to earn at the, your regular job but this way it can happen every few years so this next thing um this line actually came from someone who works in our office here he he's had a number of rental properties over mm -hmm. time and he also did a million airbnbs and the one thing that he said to us we would talk to him every few months or so in the office here and the one thing he said to us when we were talking about a client who just couldn't get cash flowing properties, he said, well, if you're not cash flowing, you're not trying. We thought that was a great phrase to say, because that's what we're in this real estate investment game for is to get the cash flow. And it starts from when you buy and then how you manage and then whether you refinance and you're still cash flowing. So that cash flowing piece is the number one thing that we strive for. And we've got a number of things here. Um, the first one is, you know, rent, portions of the property out. If you've got a, a detached garage, rent that out if you are if you need to push your cash flow up a little higher. Um, these numbers are actually a little bit off. Uh, you can rent a double now for up to $450 a month, depending where you are in the city. The closer to the center of the city, the higher the rent for these garages. Um, singles go for about 250. And we even have clients renting parking pads. So free. they may have, they may have the, the, back portion of the property on a on a back lane and it might have three stalls in there we've got a client who rents the stalls out to people with rvs mm -hmm. for 100 bucks a, a stall so instead of someone taking their trailer out to one of those rv lots out outside of the city and paying i don't know what they're paying for that two yeah. three hundred a month he's getting a hundred dollars a month for each each stall and it's just a gravel parking pad in the back of his house uh the next one is rent out rooms we've gone over that yeah. Uh, the going rate now is about thousand to twelve fifty a month for a room. Uh, basement suites, you can always add a basement suite if you have a bungalow that you're renting out and the floor plan works for a basement suite. Add that basement suite. We've had guys do it for as little as twenty five hundred dollars. Um, some people who Lisa, you legalized your suite for very little because right. it was legal anyways, right? Wow. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the next one here is um, Airbnb up to 150 a night, depending on how you do it. Uh, the guy who, like I said, came up with, if you're not cash flowing, you're not trying. He had at the at his best 17 Airbnbs, and he didn't own one single one. He did the sandwich leases. He would go out and talk to these landlords, rent their properties out and be fully upfront about it and say do i have the right to or can i have the right to sublet this place he would use it for an airbnb and he would make that spread between what he's paying the landlord or the current owner uh, per month mm -hmm. and what he could get at airbnb and the thing about that how you go to these these landlords that may not want to be landlords anymore and how do you approach them and get 
the thing under lease to to uh, sublet it on Airbnb. You just mentioned the pros of what Airbnb does. The place is being cleaned after every stay, uh, which is a lot more than a lot of my tenants do. Um, and it gets uh, it has to be maintained at a certain standard. Um, Airbnb has its own rating system. So if you're keeping the place clean, the tenants are giving you good ratings. The landlord or the current owner can see that. You can show him the stats. You can show him how often it's getting cleaned, how often it's getting inspected. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, you know, there's easy ways to get these properties under contract to become Airbnbs for you. And that can increase your cash flow if you're looking for some more cash flow. Uh, rent to own, we, went, we talked about that. And one thing we haven't talked about is executive furnished rentals. That's the last one on this list. During COVID, they went away. Uh, none of these companies downtown were bringing in contract workers. So we couldn't, anybody who had an executive furnished rental, we would just say pull the furniture out and rent it out as a regular place. Mm -hmm. Now it's back. So now we're seeing actually, we're seeing Airbnbs, our clients with Airbnbs get offered long-term stays where then it just turns into an executive rental situation. So, and, and Tim's got in here 2,200 to 3,000. That would be like on a condo. Um, we're seeing houses out there that are furnished going upwards of $5,500 per month that are getting rented out with the furniture. So it's a serious market. We're also seeing people that get caught where they're building brand new. We've seen this or they've had to sell and they just don't have a place to go move into and then they'll go rent and they'll pay ridiculous amounts of money just to get a furnished property. So there's not a lot of them on the market. You can go on rent faster and see that there is demand for it. Um, and then the best option with that as well, you could tackle doing an Airbnb on the same property as well, um, depending what you like. But Airbnb, it is more management, does take more time. The guy that, our client that had 17 of them, he had a full-time staff member just doing the bookings and making sure the cleaning ladies were going in and it was a full-time job basically. But then we've had uh, retired people um, Bob DeVos, she's retired. She owned three properties here in, in the city, still has two. We sold, we sold, we sold two, two yeah. got one now, but for the longest time, she would basically put all three properties on Airbnb and whichever one wasn't rented, um, she would stay in that property for the night. So I, we don't know how she did it. And then she would go around and do all the cleaning herself. And that was basically her job. I mean, she was retired and, and she, she did it. Now we know she got really tired. And just this year we offloaded two of the properties for her and she's down to one. Um, well, Adam here in this picture here, he's standing on the balcony of, he's got a half duplex in Malin Heights and he's on the balcony of, it's basically a bungalow, but because the it's on a sloped lot on a, that goes down in grade, uh, the basement looks like it's, a, it's a walkout basement, so it looks like it's on the main floor. So he rents each up and down out as main floor. The tenants don't know this, but you know the lower one's a basement. He puts it on Airbnb, and because it's in Malin Heights and it's got that Eighth uh, Avenue flyover across Deerfoot, you can get into Bridgeland and right downtown really quickly. It's rented all the time. He's on to his second Airbnb, which is in Haysboro. He bought an older house on Elbow Drive. We thought he was crazy when he bought it, but he just had to buy it. So. He bought it and he did a little work in the basement and mm -hmm. now he rents out, he lives upstairs and he rents out the basement on Airbnb. And even though it's on elbow drive, it's a busy road. He's finding he's his, uh, his vacancy rate is down around 20%. So mm -hmm. he's, you know, 80% of the time he's got people in there staying in his Airbnb in the basement. Yeah. This property here, he joint ventured bought, um, this property with a nurse, they actually came into one of these presentations when we were doing them and didn't know about investing, ended up buying this property together. And then the one in Kingsland on Elbow Drive there, or Haysboro, Haysboro. Um, that one there, all the furniture in the basement, we didn't know you could do this, but all the furniture is rented. So yeah. the, the side table and the bed and the couch and everything's rented. So there, there's companies out there that actually do this and, and he's still making money doing it um yeah so at the end of the day you know what there's many ways to make money and we love doing this presentation because we know people's cash flow is really tightened up with 
um, especially with interest rates. And even where interest rates are at today, it's more work on Tim and myself finding the right properties, but you can still cash flow uh, in Calgary on properties, even with today's rates. So don't be, don't be scared off by what's going on with interest rates. Um, it's just all about just running your numbers. And we do believe that over time, those interest rates will come back down um, and then the cash flow position gets even better uh, when that happens. So um, the market, it's hard to time the market. It's easier to work out how long or how you're going to position yourself to be in the market for a long time to, to actually go through what we're going through now uh, with rents going up, property prices going up and just making it work. Um, the only thing right now, we're finding that putting a little bit more money down for the people that are doing the move up program where they're putting 5% down, they're moving into it and then renting it out um, when they're done. Those properties, they're harder to find, they're harder to cash flow on. It's taking putting 10% down or the traditional investor who's putting 20% down, you can still cash flow. So that's pretty much it for today. If anybody has any questions or if there's any online questions, that'd be great too. Other than that, um, we thank you for bearing with us. This is the first in-person we meeting we've had since we were shut down for COVID. So it's been probably over three years since we've had an in-person meeting. Um, just like when we first started this out, we were, when we decided to do these meetups in person, we had like three people at our first meeting. And then six months later, we were getting over a hundred and we had to basically jam people into a room. Yeah. So once we get back to doing this on a fairly regular basis, we anticipate this room's going to be full and then we're going to have to move out to a bigger room. But it's a great start. Thank you yeah. for bearing with us and coming yeah, to the and meeting. Lisa didn't bring Fraser. So Lisa used to come to our uh, in-person seminars back in the day. And I used to tease her because it used to be date night for them to come out to <laughs> our presentations. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, and Tim, I'll just quickly speed through the next couple of slides here for the people online. Uh, once again, if you haven't read our book, One Million Reasons to Buy Real Estate, it's free. Uh, you go to calgaryrealestatewealth.com, you download it. It's a good, fun read. Um, it just goes through the core fundamentals of investing in real estate, um, which everyone should follow. The next book is online as well. Um, if you do buy a property with us, everybody gets a copy of our book. So if you plan to buy, we'll give you a book uh, when you do. Uh, that will cost you if you want to get to that. Um, it's about 20 bucks. It's $20 actually um, on our website as well. The best thing about it is it's about a lot of our clients and what they've done and the success that they're having. Um, and the reason why we wanted to do that is so you can relate to some of these people and do it yourself as well. Um, yeah, and they're on the pictures on the cover there. They're all real people. They're real clients of ours. And we went through our pictures to to maybe do the back cover over and the front cover over again. And we have so many clients that have been successful in real estate. We can't. There's too many to put on the cover. It, yeah. So it's it's actually and, quite quite satisfying. Yeah, to and it's a good read. Like the the chapters in there go in depth on doing joint ventures, so buying properties with other people actually legalizing a basement suite. There's a full chapter in there. Flipping homes, how to flip homes correctly and what kind of trends, how to follow the trends and how to do it cheaply to make the most money. Um, and there's, there's many more um, chapters in there. The next thing is we don't push this on anybody. Um, it's our Fearless Real Estate course. Um, it's not up on here, there but it's not, oh, there it is. Uh, and this thing is for people that want to to fast track themselves to creating wealth from real estate. There's over a hundred hours of content online. Um, you follow it on your own time. You could, you could do it anywhere. Uh, and it goes through everything from vendor take backs to running Airbnbs to once again, we take you through a whole video tour on flipping homes. We go through one of the properties we did in Lake Bonavista showing all of the the styles we did in the kitchen bathroom flooring we go through how much we bought the property for how much we spent on renovations and then what the end product what the end result was so people can actually see the actual numbers uh once again we don't want to push that on anybody but also it's also got all the forms you'll ever need it's got every rental form you'll need um, from getting your property leased 
the questions you have to ask, uh, move in, move out forms, leases, we've got all that. It's got all kinds of guides too. So if you're going to go out and try to raise capital, we've got a guide on that and how you can step-by-step -step approach people to, to, to raise capital. Um, joint ventures, same thing. It's and got our joint agreement. venture contract. How do you go about putting that together? You know, whether you're the credit person or whether you're the capital person, um, all those guides are in there as well. Um, so like, as I said, it's, it's not for everybody, but for the, the people out there who really want to delve deep into it, that's who we get to do it. Yeah. We put it together because Tim and I have done many courses over the years. Um, and we wanted to give you the right material to help you move forward. So we don't have crew TV on here, but oh, yeah. our YouTube channel is crew TV and it goes through all of our client interviews, our property walkthroughs. Tons and tons of educational videos on different strategies to, you know, increase your passive income to increase your portfolio. So you can see it. It's just www.crewtv. No, no, you go on YouTube okay. and you put it on Crew TV. You guys can find it, but it's worth looking at. It's free. Uh, we we enjoy doing it sometimes. Uh, we we'll continue to do it, but people like it. We've actually bought houses for people straight off Crew TV. They've watched this and then they've bought houses just off that so it's amazing uh we, well we hope everyone liked it online in person uh we'll probably figure it out in person for next time a little better as well um we will be doing another seminar in two weeks time and um if there's any questions feel free to throw them in the chat or if you both have any questions we'll yeah and some here. of the seminars will be strictly online if we have guest speakers again we do have a lot of guest speakers if we have guest speakers that can't make it or they're in another province um then it's going to be strictly an online seminar. So thanks for coming.